need. It's not just about litter bugs or litter outs as people would like it to be. That's a very convenient scapegoat for big industry just to carry on doing what it's doing. Hello and welcome to the UK Surf Show. We are your hosts. I'm Pete. And I'm Leighton. This is a very special podcast for this episode as it's centred around the most important and irreplaceable part of surfing, which is our ocean. We're extremely fortunate to have half an hour with the one and only Hugo Tagholm, the CEO of Surfers Against Sewage. Yeah, this guy is on a mission and his achievements so far are phenomenal. Uh, he educated us with with such passion in this podcast um we're we're just really happy to pass it on to you you know it just it just makes you think let's all just make the effort to just do that a little bit more and uh you know we've only got one ocean we've only got one planet yeah so now we'll get into it with hugo we start off by talking about his own surfing first don't we yeah yeah start talking about himself and then he quickly moves the conversation into the causes which he is most passionate about, which you can just tell as you listen, you can tell by the passion in his voice and the way the way he talks and his knowledge of everything. Yeah, well, it was just, you know, like, like you said, it educated us. Yeah, so uh, without further ado, here we go. Yeah, so um, we, we're wondering, uh, where do you surf mostly at the moment? Well, I, um, I live in, in, in Truro, so I, I surf... Um, depending on the season on, on both coasts, but uh, mainly up at the sort of Perrinport area. Um, sometimes at Aggie, because we're, our office is based just above Trevornance Cove. And all, all around the sort of normal north coast spots, um, depending on the size of the swell, the direction of the wind, um, you know, any surfer is pretty adaptable with moving around between those, you know, those spots that will pick up the best swell and, be you know be best uh, depending on the wind and Cornwall we're really lucky aren't we because we've got coastlines that face in every direction and that can sort of handle you know most yeah definitely yeah that, big wave surfer you know I um you know I um you know I would probably surf very average sized waves for most people but um was- so what sort of what sort of board do you normally uh, like to go to then what's your go to board again you know a whole range of sort of boards depending on conditions but you know my go to boards. Um, you know, length really is a five, sort of five ten, five eleven um, quads. Um, I've got a couple of channel islands I really like. I've got a, a, a Bonza that I've been riding quite a lot. That's really nice. Um, um, uh, you know, on on days like today, summertime, you might find me on a foamy. You might find me on a longboard. You might find me on a hand plane on some days. Um, you know, all sorts of different craft depending on the types of ways. But yeah, short boards sort of predominantly. Oh, you've got a whole quiver of uh, of boards then. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few boards. I've had most of them for quite a long time, actually. Um, so I don't, I haven't bought um, sort of many new boards sort of recently. But um, but yeah, they seem to serve a, a, a great purpose. And uh, how often do you manage to get out and surf now? Now being a CEO of SAS, how often can you still get out? Well, look, I can't surf all the time because I've got a really busy job. Um, but I surf every week at some stage. I'm in the water, um, you know, at some stage. You know, depending, surfing tends to be feast and famine, doesn't it? You know, some yeah. it can be very good and you surf more, and other times it will be quite average. You know, I haven't got the time to chase the more average days um, necessarily, but I try and get in the water every week. Um, if I can't surf, I'll swim in the sea, um, you know, and, and get a bit of time just putting some, you know, putting some... Um, some sort of um, kilometres under under my my arms, as it were. So yeah, just being in the ocean at some point is uh, makes you happy and uh, de stress. <laughs> well, look, it's a really great therapeutic thing being in the sea, and I'm a you know I'm an avid sports person. I, I think I'm an environmentalist and a, a sports person, sort of wound into one. And um, you know that's why SAS is sort of so perfect for me, and I've been able to do what I do here, um, hopefully with some good impact. Um, 
And it's really important. You know, we were born out of, as an organization, the surfing sort of community. And um, it's really important that we we remain anchored in our roots and our heritage. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that if people um, experience, you know, these amazing environments, our beaches, our beautiful ocean, the different coves and headlands that we have, um, not just in the UK, but around the world, that you'll fight harder to protect them. So, you know, I think um, it, it, it's vitally important to me personally, but it's really important for me from the organisational point of view, because, you know, we fundamentally have, have come from experiences that people have in the sea, which is not just their own personal sort of surfing experience and vantage point, but equally as important, the types of sort of pollution and, and, and sites they'll see, um, it's sort of negatively and positively. So the things I want to protect, um, you know, it's a great saying goes, people protect what they love. And and um, and that couldn't be more true for surface against sewage. So going on to the environmental side of it there, um, like obviously we've just, everyone's been in lockdown and everyone's seen the benefits of what it's been, well, what it's been like in lockdown where, you know, there's been no pollution or not as much pollution. There's been no, you know, planes going across the sky everything's been a lot better and then you come out of lockdown and it's gone the other way again it's gone completely insane i mean we went surfing as soon as we could after lockdown and the beach was just completely trashed already it's um how how, how does that how does that make you feel after that because um we we all thought uh, because you saw the positive effects of lockdown on nature um and you know that you could there's all, all stories all around the world about nature coming into cities and stuff. And then, like, and we were really hopeful that, oh, because it's going to go this way now. You know, people are going to be more mindful. And then it was the first weekend that we were out of lockdown. And like, we, we live by the beach, but it's not a surf break. And here it was just just rubbish everywhere, left by uh, holidaymakers and stuff. So, you know, how, how, does that, how does that make you feel? Like, are you in as an organization about that? Does, you're a bit disappointed in people from that or well look i think you know it's an interesting it's an interesting um situation that we've we found ourselves in with the global pandemic and of course ultimately the pandemic has really um arisen because of our destruction of nature at large so we've got to you know bear in mind that all of the encroachments that we as a as a human society on the planet have put in place on our on our forests, on our natural habitats, um, have have made these things much more likely. And we found ourselves in this this situation um, with the lockdown and in the Western sort of world, in as, as it were, in inverted commas, developed countries, a lot of the perception was very positive from the lockdown. Um, and some of it were, may have been true and some of it may have been a perception thing. People talked about birds singing more loudly. My understanding is they might have been singing less loudly because they weren't competing for the sort of airwaves, but people just thought that they were hearing them sort of more, they were hearing them more clearly. So there's some interesting things. Um, and you, you, you sort of outline quite a granular sort of part of it, which is the sort of littering stroke plastic pollution element, which is, is sort of right, which we'll come on to. You know, widely in the sort of the, 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 the the wider world, that the pandemic actually had a negative impact in many places that weren't as wealthy as the UK or other countries because people found suddenly their livelihoods compromised and had to to access resources from nature in a different way. It increased poaching, it increased damage to wild habitats, all sorts of things that could no longer be protected. So we have to be quite careful with our assumptions on what has been good and bad with it. And of course, the residual good that we see now. So, you know, there's the littering issue that you've sort of described, which is also really more broadly a plastic pollution issue because people are behaving badly, putting, leaving the stuff on the beach or in the park or in the countryside. But also it just shows how, how bad the plastic pollution crisis has got and how we need to rely on the change in legislation and business practices to stop so much plastic being put on the market in the first place. Um, but there are other things, you know, because there are other things that have been good. You know, people aren't, of course, flying so much. People aren't necessarily traveling as far afield. People are exploring and understanding their own ecosystems around them in a greater sense and in a, sort of with a greater respect. 
Um, so people people are changing and their their intentions. We did a big survey. Their intentions are good. They want to fly less, travel less. They want to work from home more. They want to use less plastic in their, their lives. They want to refill things more, all of those sorts of things. But of course, you unlock society from this 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 unprecedented event. Um, and they all went to the beach and there was a massive amount of sort of disrespect for the beach. There was a massive amount of hedonism. There was this sort of end of the world sort of scenario that we had faced. And I think there was a, a really big reaction to that for good and for bad. I think what we've got to remember is, is, is the systems just can't contain and control the plastic that we have on this planet and the other, the other things that we're manufacturing and consuming way too fast. So even if you put all of the plastic in the bin, it's going to end up being buried in the ground somewhere to haunt the planet for many years to come. Even if it ends up in an incinerator, it's going to create pollution that shouldn't be there and create a linear economy that uses resources faster than they can ever be replaced. Even if they get put in the recycling bin, we might find that they never end up getting recycled and end up getting shipped out to a country less fortunate than our own and then put in a river there or polluting the environment where people aren't as able to deal with it. So we've got to look at the whole systems change we need. It's not just about litter bugs or litter outs as people would like it to be. That's a very convenient scapegoat for big industry just to carry on doing what it's doing. We need to be able to go, how does everyone become more accountable for this? How does industry stop producing so much plastic? How do governments put the legislation in place to contain and control plastics and recycle and reprocess it here in the UK? And how do people start to respect their environments in a bigger and better way and otherwise suffer the sort of consequences of not doing so? So it's a combination of factors that we need to see. I think coming out of um, lockdown, you seem to be seeing even more use of plastic that's not going to be, you know, not going to be able to go anywhere else afterwards like i know it's needed like all the screens and all the ppe and everything like that but it's just it's that same thing again it's all just more plastic more plastic and i don't know the the government's attitude seems to be towards towards it is the problem with plastic is throw more plastic at it well no i mean you know it's it's sort of you know i mean to to your point there i think that the, the challenge is is you know there's a huge health anxiety now and rightfully you know we've seen you know, around the world, you know, what is it? 700,000 people have died from from COVID-19 now, 20 million infections worldwide, countries going back into the second um, spike of the disease and in people's own personal ecosystems, they're very, very worried about their sort of health. And sadly, this has translated into an anxiety around all sort of things being packaged and single use again. So lots of places that were making good progress on on reusable cups, on refill schemes, on other ways to avoid plastics have now taken a backward step and hopefully that's temporary. We've seen a a delay in legislation that we fought really hard for, things like the bands and straws and stirrers and cotton bud sticks. We've seen a delay in the implementation of a deposit return scheme that can create the sort of domestic recycling economy that we need. All of those sorts of things that, that must happen faster for us truly to deal with this. Because let's not forget, if we just, as I said before, if we just deal with it as a littering construct and a, a, and a linear economy, we will never, ever solve the problem. We'll be creating more and more and more and we'll have less and less space for that stuff. So we've got to be much more inventive than that. And we've got to call on all of our the people around us to be much more inventive than just thinking of it as little outs and litter bugs. We've got to think of it. How do we create the, the modern world that has a systems that can really deal with this stuff? And how can we call on business to actually reduce the amount they're doing? And luckily, we've got the environment bill coming up. That's something we're campaigning hard around. That's where we can make sure that there's an extended producer responsibility and on the big businesses that are making massive profits at the expense of our planet and our beaches. We can call for the sorts of circular economy initiatives that can reprocess not just plastics, but all sorts of materials to create a truly closed circular economy and those sorts of things, because um, we need a much more progressive mindset. We know that decades of anti-littering campaign have failed the planet systematically. Yeah. Well, that has led quite well into my next question, actually. Well, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you and, and the team for um, the, the uh, plastic bag charge, which we, we now... Uh, pay because that is that's a massive win isn't it for a, win, yeah. like a, a 
a, a charity which is in effect quite small really so that is just a monumental achievement but um so you were saying about the the new bill that's coming up and that your um campaign at the moment so what what are the new um campaigns that you've got going on are they, are they in parliament to change the legislation again or We've got we've got lots of things from sort of the beach run right through to Parliament. So of course, mobilising volunteers is a huge part of what we do, and we'll be getting you know we're getting back to that now that we can bring people together more. Um, we're about to launch a big thing called the Plastic Protest, which will um, hit this sort of airwaves this week, which will involve beach cleans, uh, sort of radical protests, citizen science, um, writing to big businesses, writing to MPs, all sorts of things. Uh, we have this environment bill where we're sort of calling for um, uh, plastic reduction targets. We're calling for more action on on the sewage that's still going in our ocean. We're calling to make sure that the deposit return scheme that we successfully also campaigned for actually comes into force as soon as possible. We need to make sure that the bans that we've called for are also going to be implemented through this. So there's there's lots on sort of resources and waste, i.e. sort of plastic. There's stuff on water quality. Of course, then we'll be looking at the wider context of where we're going into, which is um, a much m- sort of more positive agenda in many ways of, of the, the need to restore nature. So the need for highly protected marine areas um, will be a big narrative coming up. The need for much more, more action on, on the ocean and climate debate um, as we move towards COP26 in, in October, November next year. Um, all of these sorts of things and and all of our actions start by empowering a massive contingent of ocean activists around the coastline so the hundred thousand volunteers that take part in our actions every year the hundreds of thousands of people who join us for digital actions those those people who we empower to to amplify their voice to get together to create a movement and momentum towards you know what we want to see which is thriving oceans again where where we can be in much better harmony with um the ecosystems that we all so love. So what would you say to the average person out there listening that, you know, you're, you're taking on a, an industry that's, I think it's about worth 1.7 trillion or something like that. I don't know if my figures are correct. There. I know they're around there. Um, what can the average person do to, to start helping? Well, look, people can do, People can do lots of different things, and there's not there's there's a whole sort of myriad um, of organisations out there. Surfers Against Sewage and others, you know, great organisations, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, um, the Marine Conservation Society, you know, WSL Pure. Lots of people who do do good campaigns, and you can always find something that's good for you. You can join a beach clean. You can be part of a plastic free community with us you can refill your coffee cup every day you can write to your member of parliament with surface against sewage you can download the safer sea service app and lobby your mp every time there's a sewage bill at your favorite beach those sorts of things so there's always bite-sized actions you can take and there's always bigger things you can do what i would say is like we all need to start doing much more it's not enough just to scratch the surface If you think about just making a small contribution to the environmental movement, you know, it's the biggest threat. We're in an environmental crisis at the moment. We've got the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, and we are fundamentally reliant on the the planet's natural systems being restored to help us, you know, thrive on this this, this planet as best we can. So we, we can all do much more. Um, it's, um, it's important that we, we don't offset a massive sort of Western footprint of, of sort of consumption with just a small action. So we need to think about what we eat, you know, whether you want to change your diet to be more flexitarian, whether you want to be vegetarian, vegan, you know, you need to think about how much you're traveling. You need to think about how much you're consuming and try and try and, and see where you can nip and tuck your life you know, in ever increasing sort of circles to, to hopefully be a bit more sustainable, you know, fast fashion, see what you can wear for longer, keep your clothes for longer, don't, you know, buy on a fashion whim so much. So there's lots of things you can do with your consumer muscle power, but also with your voice. So lend your voice to the organisations that you care most about. Yeah, like the, I know that um, my my boys re- really want to get involved in, in beach cleans and stuff, which we're, we're, go- we're going to do this year. Um, it's kind of like a, a cool thing. It's, 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 they've made it cool for them for, for some reason. They, yeah. They're really itching to be members of Surface Against Sewage. Right. They, they, 
it's yeah it's got that cool vibe to it like i know uh, we talk a lot about the film blue juice uh, and back in 1995 when you watch it now you realize that surfacing and sewage logos were everywhere in that film it's like i only yeah. noticed that the other day absolutely so yeah yeah so it's kind of a cool uh, charity to be part of now um what are, what are the questions i was going to ask you um about now we leave. Now we've left the EU. I, I know there was um, some legislation from the uh, um, European Union to to sort out the pollution, basically in in the seas, mm-hmm. um, and which was originally what surface against sewage was about was to stop the the raw sewage being pumped into the sea. Are, are you kind of worried about maybe a bit of a a bit of a kind of rewind on, on that legislation now we've left the EU or? Are you campaigning for that kind of in preparation for that to happen? Well, look, uh, look, we've been we've been on this for you know a, a quite a quite a, a long time now, and of course the environment bill has been delayed, and that's effectively what is going to be replacing you know alongside the the agriculture bill um, as well. You know, this is what's going to be replacing lots of those EU laws. Some of them, they sort of the government will say, has been has been sort of transposed and will be upheld accordingly. But there is a great question mark of um, how the government's going to be held to account by what will be the new Office for Environmental Protection, whether we'll really have teeth. There's a question mark of whether we'll really. Um, really uh, implement legislation and introduce legislation that will beat um, European standards. Um, already we're seeing, you know, how we're struggling on water quality, for example, we're a woeful 25th out of 30 European countries for our water quality. Our rivers are struggling, just 14% of our rivers meet good ecological status. All of these things need much more action and much tougher legislation. Sadly, we're in a moment when, of course, because of you know some of the economic challenges we face, we also hear from the government agendas like build, build, build. And actually, you know, that could pose a real risk to the environment without the right safeguards in place. Sadly, safeguards environmental legislation, i.e., are often dressed up as red tape by the government, red tape that stops us from doing things, red tape that prevents our lives from moving forward. Red tape is actually often green tape, green tape that protects the beautiful world that we rely on, protects the beaches we love to surf at, protects the forests that provide us with oxygen, protects the fresh waters that we, we need for our you know well-being. So all of these things that, that we need to maintain green tape for to make sure that we don't destroy them further than we have. This is the UN decade of habitat restoration, ecosystem restoration, and we really need to see not just the conservation agenda now, but a restoration agenda where we, we allow nature to recover from the huge impacts that humanity has on it. So it, on that on that note on that note of looking what you, you know could be done or could be changed, if you could put one law into place, you know now what would that be? What would what would you say? Right, that that is what needs to change now. Well, look, fundamentally, um, fundamentally, we need to to now literally ring fence and uh, and safeguard parts of the planet that that we can't do anything in, where we can't extract any oil, where we can't take any fish out of, where we can't um, have any big impact for mining or anything. We really need to see see um, those sort of highly protected marine areas or highly protected terrestrial areas as a sort of bank account where if we let them flourish, we can sort of live off the interest. Um, there'll be high interest accounts. The more we leave them to uh, to expand and, and grow, you know, it's proven in the marine environment where you have a highly protected area, biomass increases massively. Um, the, the carbon absorption or sequestration of those areas increases too in seagrass, in kelp, in those sorts of things. And so it's really important now that we introduce the, the tough legislation laws and international agreements to achieve what internationally we're looking at at 30% of our oceans highly protected by 2030. Um, and, and that, that, that's strongly driven towards because, you know, that's how we're going to restore some equilibrium on the, the planet ocean. What inspires you to keep going? What inspires, who inspires you? What inspires you? Um, uh, lots of things inspire me, but you know, my interaction with the ocean, you know, I've always been a, an environmentalist. Um, I am a surfer um, and I, you know, get in the water as much as I can. You know, thankfully we've had some good waves recently. Um, 
Um, my son Darwin um, inspires me. He's he's really getting into surfing now. He loves he loves Cornwall. He loves wildlife. He loves the beach. You know, so the the the, the capers and explorations around the the coast surfing or coast steering or looking for nature really inspire me. Um, and this county is a great place to be based from, you know, both from a, a local perspective, but also from, a you know, having national influence and international influence. So, so you know, what I do here, the way we've been able to grow the impact of Surface Against Sewage, grow our reach, grow our audience, um, influence hearts and minds at the highest level and, and win legislation for the first time in recent years on plastic bags, on deposit return schemes, on those sorts of things, you know, those things inspire me the impact that we're having is there a chance on moving back to the 80s with that as you say then like deposit returns like i, I remember growing up like you used to take your bottle back to the shop you know your glass bottle and get to get 10p back or whatever it was is there is there a chance of going back to that sort of thing yeah well that's what's coming i mean that is that's what we've won won the fight on so that is happening we just need to make sure it's implemented as quickly as possible you know we're moving you know that we're, we're learning from the past we're moving into the you know into an into the new norm now as we hopefully come out of the covid crisis and i think the, the, the most important thing is is that we you know it, all individual actions are good but we're not going to just solve it with individual actions themselves we need to unite voices and that's what organizations like sas do unite voices to really push on the the establishment the the um you know the, the government um to to change the systems we live in you know we are you know we live in a, a an economic system we live in a carbon system a plastic system and it's up to to the the, the decision makers in whitehall and, and parliament to to help us um create a society that is truly sustainable and puts the planet and people's health above the profits of just a small number of highly profiteering multinational companies that will will literally never never stop taking yeah no there's there's a lot that still needs to be done as as you know yeah. as we can tell by talking to you. um on on the surfing side of it then so what you know you look at surfing industry look at what the boards are made of look at what the wetsuits yeah. are made of how how can surfers or how can surfing industry start to change and make that better do you think yeah, look, it's, it's again, it's like an interesting question. And there's people doing good things. You've got the Eco Board project that's sort of run out of America by our good friends at Sustainable Surf. And they do good things and working with brands like Firewire and Channel Islands to have the Eco Board mark on those boards to make sure the impact is reduced. So using more sustainable materials, more sustainable resins um, to have lower carbon emissions. You've got, um, you know, the surf industry getting in to sort of supporting things like the replanting of mangrove um, sort of habitats and the protection of reefs. Um, of course, the equipment we use is, is damaging, but you see, you know, petrochemical based the neoprene being, you know, gradually replaced by ULEX, which is a much more sustainable uh, material. You've got great brands like Finisterre looking at the potential wetsuit to wetsuit recycling and the, 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 the technology will need to do that. Um, so there's lots of things. There's the, the sort of organic and recycled yarns that that, that we'll, we'll have in sort of the apparel people will use. But I think, you know, most of all, there's a sort of a travel impact. There's a, there's a consumption impact. I think we all need to think, you know, as I said before, I've got a few boards. You know, I haven't bought a board for a while. Um, you know, how long do we keep stuff? How well do we keep it? How do we pass it on? You know, I'm assuming all of my boards will be used by Darwin um, and his friends over time. Um, uh, you know, how much we buy, you know, what do we really need? What don't we need? So there, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of questions the industry has to ask to uh, ask itself to, um, and, and push, you know, push for leadership, you know, not just having a pair of, you know, recycled, you know, boardies every year, but, you know, actually, you know, how long, I mean, how long are you keeping stuff is pretty important. You know, how long are you keeping your clothes? Um, how um, long are you keeping your boards and wetsuits? So you're just not endlessly consuming. Well, we've I've seen uh, on your Instagram that you uh, visited um, James Otter, didn't you? Did did you make your own board with him, or did you just visit the workshop? Because I know that that's kind of a bit more sustainable, isn't it? He's got a hollow timber surfboard. There's no foam involved uh, using the epoxy resin for the glass, but you know it's still dramatically reduced. Um, so yeah, did you make your own board with him, or? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. How was that process? Did you enjoy that? Incredible. James is a lovely guy, incredible guy. Um, 
and if anyone's looking for a good read, he's just written a, a do do lecture book about um, making things and the power of making things. It's coming out in September, so that's that's exciting. An incredible experience to to make it to to sort of understand the the, the you know the shaping of a board to to, to to create something that I would surf, which you know I've surfed you know I surfed it down down far west over the last few days, and it was uh, you know had some lovely waves on it. Um, so yeah, a, a, a really good process. I mean, you got to probably what you got to ask is on the surface in many ways much more sustainable on a small scale, but at scale, if everyone had a wooden board, would it would it would it be sustainable? So I think it's about the mix of what people use and how they use it. And um, you know, certainly I think um, you know it's it's a lovely bit of craft. Um, and of course, the materials are much more sustainable in their own right than a than a, a fossil fuel derived board. Definitely. Um, all right. Well, I'm. I know we're we're quite short on time today, so we'll wrap this up by saying if you'd like to tell anybody out there where they can go online, where you can be found if they want to help out, get involved. Where's the best places for them to find you? Well, look, they can. Um, um, they should come to sas.org.uk. They can sign up for the free sewage um, uh, alerts through our Safer Sea service. They can lobby their MP through that. They can get involved in beach cleans. We're about to launch the plastic protest, which will involve all sorts of um, ocean activism um, for people to get involved with over the, the next few weeks. Um, so lots of things for people to do. If they want to become a member, become a member. You can get one of those sort of T-shirts or stickers that, that you might want for your uh for your uh, for your life um so yeah lots of good ways to support what we do and we'll always amplify your voice we're very um you know very active in our campaigns in parliament we've been talking to ministers we've been um talking to all sorts of mps around the country about the action that we need to see for our ocean and so it's an exciting time and it's a good time to get involved and thanks for that hugo that was a a lot of information in that one, wasn't there? It yeah, was such a short yeah. space of time. I think we'll have to uh, listen to that again and just to process what he said, really. Yeah, well, he really knows his stuff, doesn't he? Really yeah. knows his stuff. Yeah, someone that knows a lot <laughs> about yeah. what's going on in the environment and uh, what's going on around. Well, you know, let us know what you thought of that. Uh, that's This is the first sort of proper serious one we've done you know we we do struggle with seriousness yes yeah we do yeah so but you know th- this one you you would have to listen back again and really digest what he said because it, we're going to have to do that aren't we because there yeah. is so much information in it. and we're just kind of like surfers on the ground so when we see directly uh the impact of waste on the beach where he's going to parliament and changing le- legislation it's so much deeper than than what we see so yeah, like we said, we've said in podcasts before, and we said during that interview that you know we've we've gone to the beach after lockdown, and there's just been like shit all over the beach. You know, it's just yeah. But he's saying you know it's it's more uh, the responsibility of industry rather than people. But people still yeah. have to do their part as well. So like, if you wanted to get involved with Service Against Sewage, you can contact your local rep. Don't contact Hugo directly because he's an extremely busy man. <laughs> he probably won't answer you. So in every, every region around the UK, you will have a local service against sewage rep. They will be able to give you information on the next beach clean and any other way that you can get involved. So make sure you check them out and, and do that. Do some good. Yeah, they're on social media. They're on Facebook and Instagram. They go live on Instagram quite a bit. They do different things on there. They tell you about different things that are going on and also current projects they're running. Um, they've got a website. Their address is... The address is sas.org.uk. That's where you'll go on and, and you can find it at your local rep. So punch in your region and it'll come with your local rep and their contact details. Um, there's also a shop on there where you can buy merchandise, which the proceeds go towards the charity. So that's all good. And that leads us on to a eco-friendly competition that we want to we want to run. Yeah, we're going to run this one through um, Instagram and email. So you can email us at the UK Surf Show at gmail.com or you can find us on Instagram at the UK Surf Show. Um, we've got some green stuff wax to give away and um, a hard and a medium yeah, wax. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, before we go, what we've got to give away, we should say that what you've got to do. What yeah. you've got to do. <laughs> what you've got to do to 
win this wax is send Leighton a naked photo. <laughs> no, what you've got to do, what you've got to do to win this wax and other things that are on here as well is send us your best surfing stories. So we want to hear your stories, you know, good times you've had with your mate, something someone sent me a story already on Instagram and Oh, I laughed. I laughed hard. And um It doesn't know, have to be funny. It doesn't have it to be, be funny. Moving. It will help if it's funny. But <laughs> you know, it could be a moving story, it could be something really serious. We we will struggle with that. But be aware that the story we pick as the winner will be read out. Okay? So we're gonna read that out live and you will win. Um you will win some green stuff surf wax. You will win one hard, one medium, so you've got a base coat and a top coat there. You will also win a handmade surface scrub, which is um, a, by a company called Six Foot and Clean, and it's a natural shampoo, and they also do exfoliation, exfoliating scrub. So you'll get one coffee grounds exfoliating scrub, and you'll get one natural shampoo bar. Yeah, they smell good. They smell, smell really good. good. They just smell yeah. really good. You um, might just keep them and sniff them. <laughs> <laughs> just sniffing stuff. Uh, you, I won't say that. What I really <laughs> said. <laughs> that was close. Yeah. And then there's another wax as well. We got sent, which is West Coast Surf Wax. That is handmade in Wales. That's all natural surf wax, handmade, sustainable. Um, and that's for cold water. And isn't that's it? cold water wax as well. And they sent you a nice funky little sticker with that as well. Yeah, you so, could stick it on your van. Can yeah. You and- your van, your car, your board. Yeah, cool. Your wife, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's all those prizes there. So, you know, we've got three different lots of wax there, and we've got two uh, body scrub things. Yeah, really and good. so the duration of this competition, competition is going to be to the – you've got to the end of September. Yeah. So the last day of September is your closing date for this one, and then we will pick a, a winner in before the next podcast in yep. the first of Oct- first week of October. And we will read your story, however funny, rude, <laughs> inspirational, or moving it is. We'll, it will read it out on the next podcast after the competition closing date. Yes. So that is the thirtieth of September, twenty twenty. So if you're not in by then, tough. You missed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So go over to our Instagram. We'll we'll post a picture on the day that this comes out. Uh, so there'll be a picture of the prizes that will be given away. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yep. So yeah, thanks for listening today to our more serious episode. Not used to being serious, but um, yes, it is a serious subject though, especially for surfers. Yeah. You know don't look after the ocean we won't have anywhere to surf so yeah next episode we will resume to our normal stupidity of rambling nonsense so having if, fun not that this fun. wasn't fun it's just yeah serious. no i know what you mean we we do struggle with the serious ones it's is you know there's no point trying to sugarcoat it it's not something we do very well well we, no this this podcast is meant to convey the joy of surfing isn't it but there is serious aspects to it and you know the environment is one of them and the other ones we're going to cover are going to be yeah you know yeah. like your safety in the water and things like that yeah so. definitely i mean we we were chatting about this the other day that with the podcast i we like we've said before we live a distance away from a break so i think if we lived any closer i don't think we'd do the podcast because we'd be surfing all the time yeah I, you know I, th- I don't know if that's why there's not more of these around because the people who live close enough to be surfing all the time are just surfing all the time yeah. they, they can't be bothered to do anything else but i mean we live that bit further away so we're not surfing unless it's the conditions are really good or they're going to be you know favorable it's not it's no point driving there for it so this when, is what we do yeah. to get over that this is what we do this is you know hopefully we're doing the same for you out there as well you know you're listening to a podcast it's getting you excited about surfing and the issues around it and you know just the community and everyone's just nice yeah and we yeah. want people to get in contact as well yeah, get in so. contact and get involved with us we are you know find us on instagram facebook twitter uh, we're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, and all your podcasting stations, and we're everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, it's sorry, going well. it's going well, isn't it? Yeah, it's going well. Yeah, you can't yeah. get away from it yeah, now. You can't so. get away from it. That's all right. Yeah, and the Instagram's going really well. We're uh, we're active on there, and uh, oh yeah, we've got a website. 
uh, www.theukesurfshow.co.uk slowly coming along so that's um, where we're going to have our show notes yeah we're not, I'm not going to do show notes as in it's more information about yeah, guests it's information and, about the episodes and the guests who we've had on um, so yeah hopefully most of that will be up by the time this episode comes out and uh, go and check it out um, yeah and I think it. that's it yep. so only one thing left to say is uh, goodbye see you later